Sung Kwa Ng is a PhD candidate in theological and religious studies at Georgetown University, exploring the intersection between film and religion in an interdisciplinary and comparative way. His dissertation work focuses on the way Chinese cinema inflects and refracts Buddhist teachings in the contemporary world. He is also interested in and publishes on Buddhism and Christianity, Chinese and comparative philosophy, and secular and post-secular studies. Today, we'll be talking about his recent article, Pedestrian Dharma, Slowness and Seeing in Tsai Ming Liang's Walker. Thank you very much for speaking with us today, Ten Kuan. Oh, thanks for having me today, Tony. So very excited to, to talk with you today about this, what I thought was a beautifully written article and very creative and a lot of uh, wonderful insight in there. But before we delve into the article itself, I was hoping you can tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to study Buddhism and modernity, Buddhism and film. And, you know, we're all kind of wanting to know about your current dissertation work as well and how it relates to this article. Sure. Uh, yeah, so um, my background, uh, I'm, I was born and raised in Singapore. Uh, but I'm in my 17th non-consecutive year uh, in the United States. Um, before starting this PhD at Georgetown, um, I majored in comparative literature uh, at Princeton, and then I did two master's degrees, uh, one in Christian theology, a second in East Asian religions. So that's my personal and academic background. Uh, how I came to study uh, Buddhism and modernity and Buddhism and film so um, the way I like to frame this is that, uh, at least in the West, um, many scholars often, um, and uh, sometimes Western scholars end up turning to the study of Buddhism uh, as a reaction or uh, to, to get away right, from the, uh, the Christianity that they were raised in. Uh, and so for me, uh, there's some element of that, but uh, it's a little different. Uh, so uh, when I was a child in Singapore, you know, my, my family were, um, we're uh, part of this syncretistic hybrid uh, Chinese religious, uh, <laughs> and we uh, practice uh, all sorts of stuff, uh, all sorts of uh, rituals. You know, like uh, we go to the temple, we burn incense, we altar. You know, uh, in my grandparents' home. Um, but I guess as as a kid, um, I I found a lot of these uh, rituals, some some of which were with this um, quite boring. Uh, and personally, I had a sensitive nose and. Uh, the incense really irritated my eyes. So I guess like in the same way that you hear a lot of Westerners uh, feeling that Christianity was, um, when you hear about you know, hellfire sermons, right, in church, or, or like uh, dreary Sunday school sessions, for me, kind of like Chinese religiosity was that, right? So uh, in my teenage year, in, my, when, when I, in high school, in my 20s, uh, I, I became um, a committed evangelical, and I went off, and I even did Christian, um, uh, Christian ministry, uh, and I went, went off to seminary to uh, perhaps be a pastor. Uh, but when I turned 30, uh, I, I uh, due to various reasons, I, I turned my attention to the study of, of Buddhism. Uh, and, uh, and these days, uh, I find myself drawn to non-institutional forms of Buddhism. And so that, that's kind of very much what, I, what I'm studying for my, uh, what I'm working on for my dissertation, uh, which focuses on how cinema, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, serves as a space or as a vehicle uh, for the diffusion, the translation of uh, wisdom uh, in contemporary China, uh, uh, primarily in relation to the um, the post Mao developments uh, of like um, what, what is often referred to as the values vacuum or ethical crisis, and people are searching for meaning, purpose beyond uh, material comfort. Uh, for me, cinema involves uh, not just the film text, but also production, uh, the text, and reception. Uh, and by wisdom, I mean, of course, Buddhism is a, a tradition and a religion of wisdom. Uh, but for me, wisdom is also something very basic and practical. Uh, it's about uh, living a good life, living a happy life, and finding uh, fulfillment right in what you do. Uh, and so, the article that we're um, that you are discussing today it's uh, it forms one chapter of the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating background. We've learned a little bit about you, the person behind the article. Now, the article itself is. Um, analyzing and interpreting a movie called Walker by Tsai Ming Liang. And so I was hoping now that we've learned a little bit about you, you can tell us about the background of the director of Walker and where does uh, Tsai Ming Liang stand in the larger landscape of transnational Chinese cinema and different movements influencing modern filmmaking? 
Right. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I guess um, uh, this is one uh, point of similarity that I have with Tang Lam, which is that we're both from Southeast Asia. Uh, he was born and raised in, in Malaysia, uh, but um, that's uh, East Malaysia, Borneo, Sarawak. And then uh, he has been based in uh, Taiwan ever since university. Um, and the, the Walker film um, is, um, uh, and one film in the, so the Walker film that we're discussing is part of a larger series. Uh, I think right now there are eight or nine short films in this series, uh, one of which uh, is set in his hometown in Sarawak, right? Uh, so as far as uh, where Tammy Liang stands in terms of transnational Chinese cinema, uh, Tammy Liang's name um, most often occurs, at least the first thing that you think of would be the, the, the new wave of Taiwanese cinema, or often sometimes called the new Taiwanese cinema. Uh, I, I guess uh, film historians uh, begin at the 80s, it starts in the 80s uh, with uh, film, the rise of filmmakers like uh, Ho Xiaoxian and uh, Yang De Chang, Edward Yang. Uh, and then that's the sort of the first wave. And then in the 90s, it's uh, Tai Liang together with Ang Li, who is very much uh, a, a familiar name in, in Western Hollywood cinema. Um, the, the way that um, I, I see this cinema as being transnational, right, since you use the word transnational, is that uh, first, um, the, the New Taiwanese cinema was uh, intended to be a response to the hegemony, uh, not just of Hollywood films, uh, but also of Hong Kong films. So Taiwanese cinema uh, arose, right, as a counter-hegemonic uh, um, <laughs> uh, movement. Uh, and counter-hegemonic is a phrase that uh, the star Emily Dia and Daryl Davis used in the study of Taiwanese cinema. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Taiwanese, Taiwanese cinema, cinema is like notorious, has performed notoriously bad at the local box office. So uh, it's often a, a joke, right? That people say Taiwanese people don't watch uh, the, all the films that people like Ho Xiaoxi and Tang Liang are celebrated for. Uh, but even though they failed to win domestic acclaim, uh, they won international fame, right? So uh, Tang Liang, uh, together with Ho Xiaoxian, uh, they won like a of uh, awards all, all around the world. Uh, and perhaps uh, one of the most notable ones um, was the Golden Lion uh, for uh, the I, I one, so Vive La Amour uh, in 1994. So uh, the second way that I understand uh, Tang Liang's uh, place in transnational Chinese cinema is that um, many of these new Taiwanese directors uh, had very international interests. So like uh, Edward Yang, right, he um, studied and spent many years in the United States um, before returning to Taiwan. And of course, Ang Lee, he attended uh, NYU Tisch School of the Arts and that's where he did his MFA. Uh, and uh, many of them are influenced by uh, Western which they encountered very much in the United States. So Tang Liang also is transnational in, in this way uh, because he, he comes from um, uh, he comes from Malaysia uh, and he's like a part of the larger China, Chinese diaspora. And, and his film is uh, very much celebrated uh, in France in particular. Uh, and so this kind of like really broadens um, our understanding of transnational Chinese, right? And uh, academics use many different terms, right? To understand transnational Chinese. They refer to it as Sinophone, they refer to it as Greater China, Cultural China, and all of them um, are, are, of course, applicable categories and just with different valences, different emphases. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's how I see Tamina as a transnational director. Uh, in terms of his, um, uh, his place in the different movements for influencing modern filmmaking, uh, certainly uh, one of the first um, would be that of uh, post-war Italian neorealism. Uh, and when, when you say Italian neorealism, people think of uh, filmmakers, uh, filmmakers like uh, Rossellini and Anton, Antonioni and Bellini. Uh, and sometimes say all these names makes me a little hungry because it kind of rhymes with things. But um, maybe I'll eat pasta later. So, um, but the thing about Italian neorealism and the reason why why it's a neo um, rather than just realism is because um, in contrast to um, the earlier filmmakers and film theorists in the 20th century uh, who were very uh, focused on the, 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 the cameras or the, the, the cinema's technical ability to reproduce reality per se. Uh, Italian neuralism was focused more on social existential realities of poverty and suffering uh, in, in, in Italy at that time. Uh, so from there you have a lot of you know, classics like uh, Bicycle. Um, and, and the other, um, uh, 
important influence, I would say, uh, on Taiming Yang, and this, this he has discussed uh, every now and then in his interviews, is that of um, broadly uh, European art cinema, but specifically, I would say, um, re religiously inflected uh, art cinema, uh, such as uh, Ingmar Bergman uh, and Robert Bresson. Uh, and so in contrast to um, earlier uh, cinema, like uh, Hollywood spe uh, spe religious spectaculars from the 20s and 30s uh, into the 40s, um, these uh, European filmmakers were uh, less concerned, not concerned about like spectacle, right, and, and the, the magic of the camera, uh, but uh, they were about introspection, uh, a lot of close-ups of faces, uh, uh, and, and about they were interested in wrestling with existential issues, right, through through the theme of film. So uh, certainly these are uh, such, uh, some key influences on, on time now. Uh, but I guess the last one that has to be mentioned, which, which we will mention a little more uh, as, we, as we'll discuss more in, 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 uh, as we continue talking, would be that of uh, slow cinema. Uh, and slow cinema is to be contrasted with what some uh, Marxist critics uh, call the IMR, the Institutional Mode of Representation of you know, Hollywood films, like uh, continuity editing, you know, like music, man manipulating, uh, Fewer, fewer responses, um, like very good looking and beautiful actors. Uh, and in contrast with that, um, slow cinema, uh, that's the way of all that, right? And um, the, 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 the takes are very long, the shots are very long, um, and very often uh, the, the characters are very small on the screen, uh, very little music, very, very sparse dialogue, minimal acting. Uh, and so that's really very much um, the, the flavor of, of slow cinema that uh, Yang's films represent, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry, there's a little bit of background uh, um, kind of uh, music here, but uh, fascinating response. And one thing you mentioned in there was the idea of like film responding to existential crises. At the beginning of your article, you discuss a few different models of modernity and um, and this idea of trying to heal the wounds of modernity. And that's kind of a, an important theme throughout your article. And so one of the ways that we understand uh, this kind of action to take place, at least in reference to Buddhism, is the idea of meditation. And one can meditate really in any one of the four postures of walking, lying, sitting, and standing. Yet uh, Tsai Ming Liang's Walker series only focuses on the one posture. And so I was hoping you can share with us a little bit about the history of walking meditation in Buddhism in general, and how does a film about walking meditation perform the project of healing the wounds or the idea you, you use a lot of suturing the wounds of modernity in a way that the other four, or the other three postures, sorry, cannot. Right. Um, yeah, well, um, in, in terms of um, history uh, of uh, walking meditation in Buddhism, uh, the oldest <laughs> or, or the most canonical uh, basis for that comes from the Chankama Sutta, uh, which uh, literally just, just means discourse on walking meditation. Uh, and it, it's a very short sutta, and, and I'll just read it, right? Uh, basically, the Buddha says, um, uh, these are the five benefits of um, uh, walking meditation. Uh, one is fit for long journeys. One is fit for striving, like effort, right effort. Uh, one has little disease, health, uh, uh, that which is eaten, drunk, chewed, tasted, goes through proper digestion, uh, digestion uh, and the composure or equipoise attained is long lasting. Uh, these monks are the five benefits of walking up and down. So um, uh, that was, that's the, the in, in, as far as the Pali Kayas or the Pali uh, collections or discourse, discourses are concerned, uh, that's a uh, uh, canonical uh, of walk meditation. Uh, in the Mahayana, uh, one of the uh, a pretty well-known uh, bases comes from the Avatamsaka Sutra, uh, in English known as the Flower Garland Sutra. Uh, and there's this, uh, uh, in one of the chapters, it talks about how uh, after his enlightenment, uh, the Buddha spent uh, 21 days uh, walking around circum circumambulating the bow tree uh, in, under which he attained enlightenment, uh, on uh, meditating on how to best bring uh, enlightenment to the world. Uh, so uh, in, in some accounts, uh, basically he was sitting and then somebody came to him and said, hey, you have to teach, and then he goes off. It's great. Um, but in this account, uh, he, he meditates about how to do that before he walks around to meditate on how to best bring Mahayana enlightenment to the world. Uh, 
Um, then uh, when it comes to um, the, the Chan, uh, Chan, like Zen or Chan or Son in, in Chan manuals or texts in medieval Japan and China, uh, Kinhen is sort of mentioned. Uh, very often it's just like a, a kind of a set of practical instructions, right? That it's good to uh, walk when meditate or instead of sitting all the time, walk and meditate so as to prevent sleepiness. <laughs> uh, and, and that's uh, kind of almost uh, akin to the function that one of those uh, rods, right? You know, I, I'm not sure what you call it, but basically the idea is that you fall asleep and then um, uh, a master comes around and hits you on the, on the head, on the back, that gently with a, with a, with a rod. Uh, and I guess walking meditation does that. Uh, these manuals also talk about how uh, exercise, um, meditation is a form of exercise to keep in good health. Uh, so, uh, from that lineage, uh, then we have um, uh, Menzan Zuiho, who is an uh, 18th century Japanese uh, Zen monk in the Soto tradition, uh, and who uh, I discuss uh, quite a bit in my article. Uh, and it's with him and his uh, Kim Hin Ki uh, that uh, meditation, walking meditation, becomes meditation par excellence. Right? It is the paradigmatic and best form of walking meditation. And my article uh, discusses. Uh, why he, he makes this argument and how he makes the argument, right? Based on um, former old, old, older texts as well as his uh, uh, old, <laughs> religious, political, social context. Um, according to um, David Riggs, uh, a scholar who I cite quite a bit, uh, and who was translated the uh, Kiki by Menzan um, uh, the super slow form of walking meditation that we see in the film Walker uh, is unique to Soto Zen, according to David Riggs. Uh, and it is uh, found in places um, influenced by Soto Zen. Uh, uh, so, but the, the fact remains that walking meditation today, um, it, at least for the past, past century, um, can be performed either uh, slow or fast. Uh, I mean, it's really quite simple. You just want to YouTube and you just type walking meditation or walking or Chan Xian, um, and, and you find the different videos of practitioners walking at different speeds. So it does seem like there's um, a lot of latitude about how fast uh, you walk. Uh, but I would say certainly um, uh, the, the, the speed of walking uh, 10 million ounce walker is exceedingly slow, but it still falls within the range uh, of uh, what um, Kim Hin practice accommodates. So uh, you see actual practitioners Today, walking at that speed as well. Um, right. So your, your question, and then your second question: uh, What's so unique about film? Uh, what's how does the film about walking meditation perform the project of healing the wounds of modernity in a way that other postures cannot? Right, because there are uh, four um, awe-inspiring postures that a monk has. Right, the sitting, walking, uh, standing, and lying down. Right. So why why walking? Why is walking so special? And what is it about a film about walking? That, that, what does it do that, other, that a film on other postures cannot do? Uh, and the answer I have is that uh, I, I don't think it does anything that special that um, a film on other, the other postures can't do. Uh, the reason why I say that is because um, everyone is different. Uh, and um, it's, I mean, how do you measure like liberative? Um, achievement, right? Uh, and, and, you know, in Buddhism, we often say that um, there are 84,000 Dharma doors, or like when the Buddha teaches, you know, everyone hears uh, a different message based on their own language, uh, which I, I might add is extremely uh, and, and uncannily similar to the account of uh, Babel, right? Uh, another Babel, sorry, um, Pentecost, right? Um, uh, in, in the Book of Acts, in the Testament. Um, but having said that, having said that, uh, walking meditation uh, is not that special. Uh, I would also add that uh, in terms of um, the, the reception of this film, uh, you can also see um, homages or homages uh, paid to this film where people make uh, copycat films. Uh, of course, they're, they're, they're nasty copycat films <laughs> where uh, they, they just fast forward the whole thing and such that it looks like it's regular walking. But there are people doing the exact same thing uh, and as, at the same time, I, I have a, a friend who, um, who um, is uh, a, a Chinese uh, and uh, he has the sign of um, China's largest company and it feels like multi-billionaire, you know, like billions of dollars. And, and, and he, uh, 
I shared this film with him and he loved it so much uh, that he did his own, he just made his own version of it. And he um, went around uh, the city that he was in uh, sitting, sitting meditation. So the way that he did it, he just sat uh, to, to, to remind himself, right, that uh, whatever uh, demands of his job, of his family, or, or of society, um, he might experience, uh, he can do it with a sense of inner peace and uh, equanimity. So, uh, yeah, so categorically, I, I don't think there's anything super special <laughs> about walking meditation. Uh, if I had to give an answer about what's so special about walking meditation, I would say that perhaps uh, in contrast to uh, sitting, st standing, and lying down, uh, walking might be the main uh, way to prove that someone is alive instead of dead or <laughs> paralyzed. Um, in, in the sense that while we are bio, biolog bio, biologically, physiologically, have a healthy and capable of um, ambulation. Uh, we should treasure it and, and do our best. Uh, so um, yeah, that, that walking meditation most compared to the other postures uh, demonstrates that um, the practitioner is alive. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it's just, I mean, it's a really interesting image to think of uh maybe the same movie movie walker but the person like a sitter or something like as your friend you mentioned and i mean i could see you a sleeper <laughs> the sleeper right or the or the sitter as most of us are so yeah. I, I really appreciate your answer and the the theme of walking i think is important for the director himself because you do mention how um, the director saw Xuanzang, the Chinese pilgrim monk who traveled to India in the seventh century to retrieve Buddhist scriptures as a sort of religious rebel. And that really caught my attention because I absolutely love Journey to the West. Um, I mean, that, that, that journey, uh, the historical journey, um, not the literary one, uh, is, I mean, it's just such a fascinating kind of anecdote of, of history and uh, it can really just, I mean, it's just so enthralling. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about in what ways is the defiant spirit recreated in the walker and what exactly is being rebelled against, if anything. Right, right. Um, so in my article, uh, I mentioned that um, Xuan Zhang's uh, desire or action of leaving the capital and going to the West, the Western lands uh, to get India, uh, to get scriptures was an act of uh, political civil disobedience. Uh, and here I, I cite um, Professor Anthony, uh, a late eminent comparative, comparativist and um, my dear teacher. Uh, so it was illegal for regular citizens to leave um, borders, right? And, and travel was heavily regulated. Uh, so the, the rebellion, I guess you could say that um, Walker performed some kind of you know, artistic civil disobedience. Uh, and and I, I've identified um, three ways, three things, three imperatives that, um, uh, he rebels against. Uh, the first is the imperative of faster, 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 right? Uh, a piece of uh, or what um, Edna Duffy, right, in, in a wonderful book on speed, right, the velocity trapped in what was called, but the, 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 the speed's prospect of vitality, right, that uh, fast cars, you know, like, or even why the Olympics just concluded, right? Why do we um, love watching, I mean, we watch the marathon, but the 100 meters, oh my gosh, that's like, uh, that's the most one of the most celebrated events, right? So, um, it, so the the film bells against the fast pace of life and the fast pace of editing, right? That a lot of films, um, um, the, the IMR, the institutional mode of representation, uses. Uh, and the, the way I think of it is that um, this form of editing it, it just like loads the brain, stimulates the brain with like endless endless trigger of dopamine, right? We were kind of like addicted to dopamine. Uh, and the, the recent, um, a really um, insightful documentary on Netflix called uh, The Social Dilemma, where it talks about the, the dangers, right, of uh, being exposed to constant um, social media, constant iPhone phone usage. Uh, and I would say, um, yeah, constant, if, if our default taste, right, in films is only uh, like explosions and bombardment, bombardments and, and like uh, explicit, <laughs> uh, Raunchy sex, raunchy sex, or, or violence, you know, it, it does something to, to our sensibilities, right? Our, our taste of, of, of what life is or what life could be. 
Um, so, and the second um, uh, imperative that I, I think the film fails against is uh, that of more, right? Uh, the sense that we need to get more uh, to be happy, right? And so, uh, in, in fact, like without even saying very much, right? By just um, capturing in, in a shot, right? A, a still meditative bunk against the, 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 the cityscape, right? Of towering skyscrapers and, and banks and cars. Uh, it, it, it rebels against the sense that we have to uh, get somewhere to be happy, right? That right now, right now, like right now, there is something profoundly um, wrong or insufficient with us, right? So the film rebels against that, right? That um, we, we don't need more money, we don't need a better body, we don't need taller buildings to be happier. Um, I mean, granted, there, there is a certain level of um, financial um, security that is, is basic, right? That's, that's a baseline, right? But at least in the developed world, since assuming that everyone listening to this is, lives in the developed world and that um, basic necessities are, are met. Um, but yeah, above that, right? What, do we, what are we looking for, right? What do we want that, that, is, that we feel we don't have that has been miserable? Um, and a quote I, I've always liked, which I, I think aligns pretty well with this vision, is uh, it goes, uh, growth for the sake of growth is also the ideology of the cancer cell, uh, attributed to Edward Abbey, an environmentalist. And so, yeah, they're just, I mean, I, I, I don't think the film is like all that didactic and saying, hey, you know, you guys should stop. Everyone should just stop, stop what they're doing, just be monks. It, it, I don't think it says that, but um, it invites, it makes you think, right? It, it, it kindles, perhaps, hopefully it kindles something in it, it, its worse. Um, yeah. And then uh, the third thing I would say that um, the film, uh, the defined spirit uh, of the film can be found also in its uh, rebellion against homogeneity. Uh, I mean, the fact that, um, that the monk sticks out, right? I mean, he's wearing uh, the garb of Theravada, uh, Buddhist monk, and he, he's just like, like a sore thumb, right? In, in, uh, there's, there's a Japanese proverb, right? Like the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Conformity, the pressure to conformity, peer pressure, FOMO. Um, and uh, one thing I've noticed uh, from, from, from my friends who uh, teach anthropology classes is that very often it seems like uh, lesson one is always an experiment, right? It, where where you, you, you go, go to a public setting uh, and uh, they just do something that is out of the ordinary and then they feel the, the, the derision or uh, incredulity uh, of onlookers when you do something weird, right? Like in the middle of a, of a road, you just sit down, right? Or, or you just dance, dance instead of walking. So it, it takes courage, right? It takes um, uh, this kind of uh, a, a, a defiant and rebellious spirit in order to really internalize and, and live in a way that, that runs counter to uh, the prevailing uh, norms. Uh, but I would say it, it's, and since uh, this, this is being recorded for a class set in Canada, uh, and since we are in the West, I, I would like to add that it's not rebellion for the sake of rebellion, right? It, it's about rebellion for a more beneficent, um, uh, a better form of life that, that, is, uh, that promotes, that is more conducive to promoting happiness, right, instead of um, unhappiness, yeah. <laughs> There's so many kind of uh, important points that you make in that film. Um, the one thing that, that really struck, or, sorry, in your answer there, and the one thing that really struck me was the idea of this this film making you think. And I would even go so further that it it kind of makes you experience or it makes you almost rethink your own perception. Because when I was watching it, I almost had to like detrain myself how to watch a movie. Because normally, as you say, my eyes are flittering back and forth. There's all these things happening. It's very easy to just kind of sit back and allow yourself to be almost, I don't want to say attacked, but, you know, uh, entertained. Whereas this film, you had to, you had to kind of retrain yourself and, and, and pay attention to what's going on in, in a more methodical way. So it like taught me how to watch a film again. Uh, or taught me how to watch a film in a different way. And one of the big things that I found was, and you mentioned this in your article, the difference between the slow walking monk and the, the fast moving people going about their business. And so you talked a little bit about this already in your last answer, but the people on the street are, they're reaching certain destinations. They're going certain tasks. We can kind of imagine what they're doing. That's what we do on our day. 
Whereas the walking monk seems to be wandering the city with no final dis- destination or preconceived goal in mind. And so I was, I was hoping you could now talk a little bit more about the philosophical aesthetics that I really like how you use that term. So what concepts of Buddhist practice and enlightenment are symbolized by this aimlessness and the slow aesthetics of the film? And how did these philosophical aesthetics contrast modern ideas of efficiency, modern ideals, I should say, of efficiency and human progress? Right, right. Um, yeah, uh, in, in terms of um, the f- uh, philosophical aesthetics, uh, I, I would say that um, for, for Buddhism, it, it's philosophical and it's also, um, it's, it, since we're talking, discussing the, the Buddhist dimensions right, of this film, uh, it, it's also uh, very much inherently uh, therapeutic, right? It's meant to, um, so there, there's a problem, right? And then there is a solution, <laughs> uh, just as um, the, the Buddha uh, is described as um, a, a great doctor, right? And uh, the Dharma is uh, the medicine. Right, that, that heals the ills, that all that ails um, human beings, uh, beings, not just human beings. Um, so the problem of, of, of course, is that of suffering or yeah. Uh, and and the way, in terms of um, the, the the way that uh, the, uh, the Buddhist system conceptualizes suffering, uh, there there are a few um, uh, key terms, right? A few ways of understanding. The, the, the textures of suffering. <laughs> uh, and w- one uh, helpful uh, concept is that of the three poisons, um, that um, in the same way that we, uh, the three poisons are uh, greed, hatred, delusion, or like, you know, um, craving, aversion, right? There's just different ways to translate those terms. Uh, and, and these three uh, energies or impulses uh, are, the engine of some star, right? He says, always wanting, always thirsting, always raving for more, always thirsty for more, it's being satisfied, right? Uh, and uh, the, an- another way uh, that, an- another problem, right, that um, I-, I think the film's philosophical aesthetics tries to address is that of, it is encapsulated in the notion of pancha, uh, and th- that's translated as um, conceptual proliferations, or just like this, that the mind's habitual tendency to weave narratives, right, and just live into these worlds, and you know, and keep, just like how, as you mentioned, that yeah, it, the watching the film does take a kind of retraining, right? Because you know, as you're sitting there, you're watching a film, and like nothing much happens, right? It's kind of boring, right? It's, it's blah, right? It's like. Um, and and if, I guess I, I don't have children, but for those of you who, who do have kids, right, you can imagine how uh, much a child needs constant amusement or entertainment, right, uh, because they just need stimulation. But I, I guess like as, as adults, the, there's something about um, the maturation of our cognitive capacities that tries to do away with all that. So uh, the, 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 the taste for always constant stimulation. So these are the problems, right? That that on the film, or at least that, that are quite basic to the human position. Um, uh, the, the solution then that the film uh, offers by, by its proper aesthetics, right? The contrast to uh, efficiency and progress uh, is mediated by uh, the, the style of slow cinema, which we described involves, again, uh, you know, um, a distanciated camera or a sparse dialogue, no music. Um, it, 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 to me, it, it's almost like um, like temple food, right? Uh, and, and there's this wonderful Netflix documentary called uh, Chef's Table, and there's an episode in there on this Korean nun called Jong Kwan, uh, and she she talks about how uh, temple cuisine uh, there, there are certain kinds of foods, uh, certain kinds of spices and, and uh, condiments or bases that you don't use. You don't use garlic, you don't use onion, because these things are, are agitate, right? So it's very it's, it's about calming the sense such that, you, such that it no longer um, it can so that you do away with, right, with your need for something extremely salty or something very sweet or something very it's about taste you know, right uh, so slow cinema fosters contemplative uh, equanimity right a sense of quietude uh, and uh, the, the the concepts of Buddhist practice uh, are very much encapsulated in um, the uh, the eight noble path, and, and on the eight noble path, there are, there are three particular um, uh, activities or paths that um, I think the film really aligns nicely with. Uh, the first is uh, right effort. Right, you need to exert yourself 
in order to focus on the film. Uh, it, it takes effort, right, uh, to, to guard your sense faculties against, uh, you know, oh, this is boring. There's a thought that goes, this is boring, this is stupid, this is my time, what's going to happen next? Uh, oh, my, my dog's barking, I need to cook, I need to So you just you need to just exert effort there, right? Uh, and the, I would say that the second uh, of the eightfold, the second path, right, that the film really aligns with uh, is that of right mindfulness, uh, right, sati in Chinese, zheng uh, nian. Um, basically, um, the way I understand it is um, cultivating uh, awareness, right, of everything that is happening, uh, including your mind. So basically, like your mind's eye, as well as the the feel of the, the feel of the film, kind of just like melts together, and then you just observe. Just you just you you sit still, you observe, and the way that I, I've heard meditation teachers talk about it is that of um, like um, a glass, right? And that, that's quite, um, that's full of sediments. And if you keep stirring it, the, the, the water is murky. But if you just let it just oh, take a step back, stop stirring it, and, and it just settles down and it just becomes clear. And then you just see. So, I mean, every single frame of the, of the film invites you to, to just oh, be, um, practice right mindfulness, right? <laughs> sati, to just sit and, and, and watch. Uh, and then the, the complement, right, of, of sati is that of samadhi or right concentration uh, in Chinese, uh, zheng ding, right? Um, and as of, whereas mindfulness is kind of about uh, watching, observing everything, <laughs> uh, concentration is a, it's a kind of absorption. It's almost like some people translate it as trance, or, or you kind of like lose yourself in the film, such that you're almost like one, right, with, with the with the film, and this is where the uh, my where we're like object subject dualism uh, is is transcended, right? Where uh, you you fuse with this reality that is there, such that just like any it's a one a kind of like a one pointed uh, sharp experience of of this film that you are you are watching. So the the satya and samadhi go hand in hand, and then finally uh, just just to since you asked about concepts. Uh, that this film instantiates. Uh, uh, I would say that there is, there's also the concept of samasa uh, or zhi, uh, basically just uh, stilling, right? Stilling. Uh, and with, with that, the, the tranquil cessation uh, uh, of nirvana, like a nirvanic serenity where uh, you just experience where things are just, so it's, it's, so it's really hard to talk about. Not going to run, right? I mean, I mean, it's mostly indescribable, right? But I, I, whatever words can say, we'll say that yeah, it involves um, kind of tranquility. So yeah, I, I think if we if we sit with the film, we dwell with the film uh, long enough, it, these postures can can be cultivated, and and via that, right, we we learn to sit with ourselves, right? We sit with uh, other people. Uh, and I'm going to remind of a passage by Simone Bay, uh, W E I L, um, this, this wonderful essay called uh, "The Right of School Studies uh, for the Love of God." Okay, yeah. I just if you want to search for it, just type those keywords onto Google. Basically, the idea is, you know, she says, uh, well, "What is love of neighbor?" You know, love of neighbor is to ask your neighbor, "How are you going to?" Be? And, and um, really listen, right, to what your neighbor is saying. So, I, and so I, I would say, you know. This, Meditation technique, right? Yeah, okay, fine. You know, it, it's it, it shouldn't be seen as an end in itself. I, I mean, but what, what I mean is that um, it, ultimately, I, I think it just helps us be more comfortable in our own skin, uh, be more present in the world, uh, more present with, with others. And I, I really do think that there, it aligns uh, quite nicely with the, um, the focus on self care uh, and and, and, and the therapeutic angle with which uh, this course is being uh, taught, right? So much there to uh, to unpack, and I mean, it's an amazing film that it can it can it can tackle or capture so many kind of Buddhist concepts, these philosophical aesthetics in, in such a relatively short time frame. Um, and your article does a wonderful job of, of picking uh, picking uh, some of these out. And, and I thank you for your answer. You've mentioned the term therapeutic a couple of times, and you, you had this really interesting term you just mentioned about the film inviting you to practice. And that's, that struck me. And so, and an important 
idea you raise in your article is the idea of the monk in the movie Walker becoming an object of meditation himself, a casino or heuristic device that helps one develop concentration of mind and some of those other path factors that you mentioned. So I wonder if you can, if you can expand on this idea to other films with Buddhist themes and speculate on how the act of watching such films can become its own form of practice. Right, right. Um, so uh, the, my, my understanding of um, uh, film watching as uh, Buddhist practice or contemplative practice uh, is certainly informed by my own experiences uh, with, with a whole wide range of, of world cinema. Uh, but very much um, um, the, the work of Francesca Cho, uh, also based at the of my advice, uh, has really helped me articulate uh, a lot of these experiences. And she talks about um, how um, Film watching can be a, a ritual experience, uh, and it becomes less about um, what you watch, what you see, and and how you see, right. So you, I think you mentioned the phrase um, "films with Buddhist themes" or, or something like that or at some point. Uh, and the, the thing is, um, films don't necessarily have to have an overt Buddhist theme in order to uh, cultivate uh, this sort this sort of. Um, equanimity, right, or this sort of uh, posture. Um, and and it, it's very much, the, the way that I understand uh, film viewing as a uh, ritual or contemplative practice uh, is that um, in the same way that um, uh, Olympians, right, they train and they, they develop muscles. So it, it's about cultivating our mental existential muscles uh, or, or the muscles of our mind's eye, right, our, our eye muscles. Or, um, and uh, because discipline makes us strong, right? The, the, the stronger we get, uh, the, the, the more we train ourselves, the more discipline makes us, the, the, the stronger we get. Uh, but at the same time, um, film ritual, I, I just want to say, even though uh, film watching is very often a very um, individual experience, uh, there, there's also a sense of uh, community uh, I, um, identified by film taste. And so this is where uh, ideas of, fandom or fan network uh, kind of, they, they kind of like uh, coalesce or they, there's some that uh, uh, an idea of like the, the, the Sangha, right? The, 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 the monastic community or that of the Buddhist institution, the, the religion as institution. So uh, I, I do think um, sometimes it's easier to run a race uh, when, when you're, when you're not, not alone, when you have other people. So I, I'm just saying, all I'm trying to say, right, is that uh, film watching can also be a communal experience, whether you watch it alone or knowing that you are part of this like imagined uh, community of cinephiles or, or appreci um, aesthetes or, or just regular people who enjoy this sort of films. And, and there are a lot of platforms uh, um, where such communities can, can coalesce, right? Um, so uh, in terms of um, expanding this idea to other films with groups, it seems. So, uh, I mean, when, when people think about um, overtly films, right, um, often we, we think of, um, say, Bhutanese uh, Buku director uh, called um, Kensei, Kensei Norbu. Uh, he's made films like The Cup or um, Magicians and Travelers or The Travelers and uh, And we also think, for example, about uh, this <laughs> character called Kim Kita, right, who made uh, Spring, Summer, Autumn, Winter, and Spring. But R.I.P. and also now disgrace he passed away uh, because of COVID. Yeah, he passed away because of COVID. Um, so, but th these films, even though there are a lot of their films, even though they are explicit Buddhist themes, uh, they don't necessarily um, uh, represent this kind of filmmaking style or this style of Buddhist contemplative film watching, film viewing represented by by Walker. Uh, Rather, I, I would say that it's um, like films that do the do take their Buddhism pretty lightly, not so seriously, or uh, what um, William the Third uh, calls uh, Buddhism at a low temperature, right? Just in the background, right? Rather, rather than something that's uh, 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 carried around like a trophy, right? Or something that's really, really explicit and overt, uh, where where they're like monks and uh, scriptures and, and uh, or reincarnate, all, all that stuff. So uh, I think film, other films in this vein, the same vein of, as, as uh, Walker, that I love that I, and uh, that I have personally benefited tremendously from, 
are films by Wu uh, Desajiro, uh, by Hou Xiaoxian, another Taiwanese director. By, and of course, these are they're, they're really famous, right? And in America, among Western viewers, Terence Malick is another one, really famous. Uh, and, and all these films, I think, are, are very, con all their films, no, a lot of their films are very fostering this sort of con contemplative ritual experience. Uh, but I would also like to um, identify some uh, lesser known directors. Uh, I would say Anne Hui, yeah, Anne Hui, H-U-I. She's, uh, she's a Hong Kong director. A lot of her, her films, especially um, this film called The Way We Are, uh, and um, it, it, in, in Chinese it's uh, the, yeah, it's part of a, a trilogy of films. Um, and Hui is Films are really wonderful. Um, Chang Dong's films, uh, like film like Good Sunshine or Poetry, and also per perhaps uh, most recently known for Burning, uh, which won him Best Director at Cannes. Uh, and then uh, also this film by, and the films of um, uh, Lee Isaac Chung, most recently known for Minari. Uh, but his first film, uh, Nirangabo, uh, which was the first film made uh, with native Rwandans in Rwanda uh, uh, was, I would say, one of the first films I watched back in 2007 that taught me how to appreciate plants and trees. Uh, because they're like, some, some, one of his shots where basically he's just like panning up, just like looking looking at a, a banana or plantain tree. And, and it was just mesmerizing. <laughs> and ever since then, I, I just never looked at trees the same again. Uh, and I guess, I, 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 in the same way again. And I guess I'll just close uh, this pretty long, long uh, mythic um, uh, and smooth thing with uh, an anecdote from uh, the Gateless Barrier. Uh, this is a collection of Zen koans from old China, Japan. Uh, basically, you know, the, 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 the anecdote or the case or the story goes um, uh, so there are two monks and they see uh, a flag fluttering in the wind, right? And then Monk A says, Oh, look, um, the, the wind. The, the, the flag. And then Mark B says, oh no, it's the, the flag that's moving. Uh, then of course the master comes along and says, ah, it is your mind that is moving. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I think very often um, it, it's not that our, our minds uh, should not move at all. Obviously our minds are always moving, right? But it's about um, deconditioning ourselves, right? From a certain uh, reactivity, a certain thirsting and tasting that this has to be this way, or if I don't get this, if I don't have this, if I'm not like that, then what, oh my gosh, right? This uh, constant anxiety and neurosis. So uh, I, I do hope that uh, viewers uh, or listeners uh, will, 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 um, will consider watching the film in its entirety. And it's not easy. And on the first sitting, I, 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 I skip, I fast forward it, right? But eventually I, I watched it <laughs> in its entirety. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a really a special experience. And really um, any film, almost any film, uh, I, I think is suitable for, for this sort of, um, can, can foster this sort of template experience. Yeah, I, I have to completely agree that it's a, it's a special experience to watch the film and um, it, it definitely kind of changes the way that you look at films. Uh, we're very grateful for your time today. Ten Kwan, and we've um, we've asked you a lot of questions. Uh, I, I wonder, do you have time for one more? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, now this one kind of is this is kind of at the beginning of your article, but I think it's a good way to end, and it, it particularly has to do with the relationship between Buddhism and modernity. And I mean, I think one of the more profound insights that you make in th in the article is that um, you know we think that the Walker is in conflict with modernity, and maybe even somehow transcendent or or outside of of the the busy frenetic city but you know i was hoping you could talk a little bit about how this film but kind of the study of film and religion in general tells us that modernity and buddhism are not just in conflict but that but that modernity itself can be a, a source of liberation and i thought that was a really profound point that you made and i was hoping you could maybe end our discussion with a little a little bit about sharing your insight there Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, when we talk about modernity, right? So I, I think it's always helpful to uh, clarify or define some of the terms that we use, right? And so here's the thing, right? We, we use this term 
to be modern all the time, right? Oh, you know, modern architecture, modern aesthetics, uh, uh, you know, or a modern looking hotel, modern cuisine. <laughs> but what, what, what does modern mean, right? So besides um, being a kind of a chronological marker, right, of now rather than a really long time ago. Um, so the, I, I think that the sense, and this is certainly informed by uh, Max Weber's uh, understanding of modernity, uh, which is that um, the, 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 the pre-modern, right, is that which is um, uh, religious and supernatural and enchanted, right, where, and it, again, Max Weber was certainly writing in the context of Western, Western society, Western civilization, and of course, his paradigmatic religion was Christianity, right? Uh, and, and the world is is uh, an enchanted place, right? I mean, uh, things happen, at least according to the religious worldview, right? Uh, things happen because God predestined them, um, and uh, everything happens for a purpose, uh, and, and there is a cosmic balance of reward, right? You, you um, good, goodness will prevail, right? And evil will be vanquished, right? So there's a kind of chaos, there's a kind of order, cosmic order to things. And then to be modern, right, if, if that is to be pre-modern, right, to be modern then is to be secular and scientific and rational, right, because a, a, a rational person, a scientific person today, we say, uh, does not think that the rain is caused by God being angry, right? Uh, a, a rational person doesn't see, a rational person, uh, doesn't see any um, correlation between sacrificing uh, a baby and, and bringing good harvest Right uh, or or that um, the, the the death of uh, a person on the cross is able to magically right um, uh, bring salvation to all of humanity right so so that, that is the way that um, that these um, that these antonyms right are, are are being set up right that there is the the modern and the pre modern and then um, religion right religiosity is the enchanted worldview. Uh, is to be modern, and then to be modern is to be scientific, right? So then, then that's a, of course, it's a little simple, but I, I think this is what uh, what enjoys currency. So it's it's one thing, right? I, I would say for for academics like, like us <laughs> to 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 nitpick and be critical and say, oh, these, these terms mean this and this term. But yes, but generally, right? When people think of modern and pre-modern, this is the, 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 the these are the hidden assumptions, right? These are the this is the context in which these things occur. So. Having talked about uh, modern being the, the, the distinction between modernity and modernity, then we say, okay, what is this thing called this modernism, right? So Buddhist modernism then is about uh, adapting uh, Buddhism, right, to uh, modern sensibilities, right? Buddhism being a pre-modern ancient tradition, uh, how does it uh, adapt? How, how does it interpret itself, right, for 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 today's world? So uh, I, I think there are different ways of um, understanding, uh, different models, right, for understanding this process, right? So model one is, you know, uh, all this, uh, because these things, right, um, like mindfulness, right, is being practiced in hospitals and schools and prisons, uh, in boardrooms, right? And, and, and you see, um, say, <laughs> Richard Gere <laughs> or, or, or the Dalai Lama as like very public figures, right, in, in the, the promulgation of Tibetan Buddhism in the West. And so the, there is one position that says, you know, all this is a fabrication, all this is construction, all this is fake, inauthentic Buddhism. And then on the other hand, there's another um, approach that says, well, um, as I mentioned, right, that the Dharma is apparently therapeutic and, and it's okay to adapt and to um, zoom in and hone in, home in on, on certain features of a pre-modern tradition that meet uh, contemporary. So uh, th that's kind of what I mean by a, um, well, as I mentioned in the earlier article, the, the, double, uh, 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 the, the double imagining, right? So the double imagining is that um, on the one hand, Buddhism represents the antithesis, right? It, it is uh, everything that um, being modern is not, right? You don't believe hell realms, you don't believe incarnation, you don't believe that in your next life, all that is just too mythological, too fantastic, too supernatural, so that no good, right? Um, and at the same time, um, a lot of uh, Asian Buddhist, um, uh, Buddhist practice is very ritual based, right? It's about um, uh, prostrating, it's about being the Buddha, it's about releasing fish on Bisante, 
Uh, so th these things are, are also anathemized, right? They're also uh, ostracized by the kind of um, anti-ritual uh, logic of um, Protestant inflected modernity. Um, but then the way that I would say Buddhism uh, deals with this is that uh, having living in, in a disenchanted world can be very uh, uh, disillusion disillusioning and, and very um, traumatic, right? For, for people who've, who've, who've grown up, right? Under uh, what people call it, the canopy, where uh, there's a, the world is, there is an order, there is a more absolute moral law, uh, and, and that good will win at the end of the day, right? So it's traumatic, right? To, to transition, right? From, from an enchanted world to an disenchanted world. And there is a constant nostalgia for, for, for meaning, for, for this, um, Telos for of history and, and also nostalgia for um, uh, a transcendent purpose. Right? I, I think a lot of people want that uh, to be able to conquer the fear of death. Right that after, like my life is not just meaningless. Right after death, um, something happens and, and my life means something. Right. So, uh, so there, there's this disenchantment, this widespread disenchantment in, in uh, I would say, the post-Christian uh, world or ex-Christendom. Right. And the Pandora's box has been open and there's no going back. So I, I would say that um, Buddhism offers a system of ideas and practices uh, that, uh, that fits the bill, right? On one hand, that it, it, uh, Buddhist modernism, right? It is scientific, its cosmology is natural. Uh, it, uh, in, uh, but at the same time, it kind of um, offers, uh, it, it zooms in on, on the needs of human beings. Uh, and, uh, I would say that, that there are two particular features of Buddhism uh, that, uh, that enjoy a great collective affinity uh, with modernity. Uh, and the first would be that of uh, the focus on individual, right? That liberation is, or, or happiness is to be achieved uh, by yourself. It's personal, it's experiential, uh, it's something you do. And that kind of uh, you know, fits very nice with um, the Buddhist exhortation on his death, right, to his disciples. To be lens unto yourself, right, and uh, uh, to yeah, to 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 that that the practice is something that you do achieve on your own. So, uh, and then the, the second feature of Buddhism that of modernity that Buddhist modern Buddhism really zooms in on is that of the imagination, that um, the world has always been uh, intersubjectively uh, constructed um, there, and and I would say, and, and by intersubjective, what 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 I mean and what it does is that it, it kind of like walks a, mid, a nice middle path between um, loosey goosey solipsism or subjectivism uh, and uh, cold heart objectivism. So that there, so I, I would say that Buddhism really does teach right, or affirm that there are objective realities, but these objective realities are not out there in the world of facts. But that uh, rather all facts are storied, like they, in, uh, as Wendy Doniger, an eminent comparative physiologist, puts it, that we, we inhabit um, narratives, right? And, and so to, to me, this is why a film like Walker, or why I'm so interested in uh, the, the Buddhistic uh, liberative potentials of, of cinema, right? Where um, art itself, right, becomes um, this. It's this interstitial, <laughs> to use the first national, uh, liminal space, uh, whereby the intersubject imagination uh, finds room to to grow, to be to be nourished, and, and I, I think that really is the way that it's at least for um, disenchanted, post-critical <laughs> moderns. Uh, there's no going. It's very hard to go back. It's very hard to go back, and you just have to. Uh, see, um, see the imagination, right? The aesthetic imagination uh, as the means by which find uh, enchantment and disenchantment. Thank you so much. Uh, I, for one, feel that your article gave me my own kind of aesthetic imagination a lot of room. You provided a space for me to not only kind of um, learn more about 
the director and the history of walking meditation, but also you enhanced my experience of the film Walker. So I'm very grateful for that because it's a wonderful film. You have a wonderful article together. They really, um, you know, they enhanced my experience and it was such a wonderful uh, experience to talk to you today. So I think that will also enhance everyone's experience. So Tenkwan, I just want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of everybody for speaking with us today and for teaching us all that you have. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Tony. Thanks for having me.